Hey, thanks for joining us today. My name is Drew Ketchum. I am the campus pastor down at the Green Campus. Uh, and to get started today, I'd like you guys to join me in doing something real quick. I want you to think back uh, to a recent time that you were troubled, uh, and, and not just something bad was happening to you, but what was going on inside. And I want you to process what that was and how you responded, both to what was going on internally and how you resolved the situation externally. So we're going to take about 10 seconds to do that. All right, so in, in, after this, if I went through and pulled everybody asking what their troubles were, how they went about fixing it, I would likely find that the, the troubles and the ways you go about fixing it are unique as the number of people that just were listening and participating, right? Because troubles in a troubled heart are a universal part uh, of the human experience. Because of sin, we will all have troubles. We will all experience troubles. It's something that every, each and every one of us goes through. And so I want to share with you some troubles. Maybe you can relate, okay? So uh, it starts out like this. You really enjoy camping. So uh, you also have kids, and the tent camping is really not working anymore. So you decide you're going to get a trailer. And if you get a trailer, uh, you have a problem because you also need a truck to pull it. So you go out and you buy a truck. And then you take these, uh, the truck and the trailer. You go camping, and everything's awesome and great. And you're heading back home, and you're going through Camas Valley. And uh, as you're going back to green, right, there's a hill that leads up, a big steep hill. And as you go up the hill, your truck falls flat on its face, right? It just loses power, uh, like, and, and, and your heart falls flat into your stomach, right? It is a terrible feeling, and you're freaking out, not knowing what to do, right? And so you do the only thing you could think of, which is pull over and turn the engine off, and then you're just going to keep doing that, turning it back on, driving a little bit, turning it back off. Like it's a computer, you're just going to hit reset, and the engine's going to work, right? And fortunately, right, you're able to get this truck up over the hill with the trailer, and you're able to limp the truck home, right? And all the while, you're just, you're a wreck because you're thinking, what's going to happen? Uh, is the engine going to explode? Am I going to have to get a tow truck and spend money on that? Which means that the truck's going to have to get fixed, and what's going to happen to the trailer? I got to work tomorrow, on and on and on. But you get home, right? But then you have more trouble. It just keeps compounding now. You have to fix the truck, and you're frugal, and one of the ways you do that is you take and you fix your own stuff so that you don't have to pay somebody else to do it. So now you have to research, and by the way, you decided to buy a diesel truck instead of a gas, and you know how to fix gas, but you never fixed a diesel truck before, so now you have to figure all of that out, right? It just keeps compounding, and as you're doing it, right, it's taking a long time. Money's piling up. Time in particular, it's piling up as you're tearing this truck apart. And you're looking at yourself wondering, what is everybody else thinking? Do they look at me and, and the guy who bought a diesel truck who has no idea what he's doing? Why would he even do that? And what does it say about how he spends his money that he bought a truck that doesn't work and, and, and now he can't even get his truck fixed? Or maybe your troubles look a little different. Maybe you're married. You have a spouse, right? And you have a wife. And, and is, is inevitable in, in marriage, you have a disagreement. And this creates a rift in your relationship, right? You are made to be one flesh and be unified in all things. And in this moment, you're not unified. And it's eating at you a little bit. And you have to go back and sit down and really process the disagreement. And you realize that you were wrong. Your wife was right. So now you have to go ask for forgiveness. And that's really hard. You've never been wrong before. So you don't really know how that looks. And, uh, and you don't just want forgiveness, which takes time, but you want reconciliation so you guys can return to an intimate, full relationship uh, that God has planned for you. Or maybe, just maybe, <clears throat> right, you have a seven-year-old daughter, and this seven-year-old daughter is the most amazing thing in the world, uh, and she has this gift of joy. She is the most joyful person you've ever seen, right? And it's a long, hard week at work, and you get home, and you kick your feet up, and you're tired, and you're exhausted, and in comes your daughter. She's bounding, and she wants to tell you all about what happened today, and she wants to spend time with you. So she comes to you, and in your exhaustion, and selfishness, and all of that nastiness, right, you snap at her, just give me a couple minutes of peace and quiet, huh? And she slinks off, and she's crushed. You have stolen her joy, right? You sinned not just against her, but you sinned against God who gave her that joy, Right? And now you have to fix things with her, but you just picture the future, right? She's going to be an adult sitting in therapy, saying to her therapist, everything was good until my dad ruined it all. Right? Maybe some of those troubles right, sound familiar to you, right? Troubles are a part of our lives. In fact, Jesus, a couple of chapters from where we're going to be looking today, said, in this world you will have troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Troubles 
are inevitable. Trouble is inevitable, right? But Jesus said, though you will have troubles, you don't have to be troubled, right? And that's what we're going to be looking at today. What does Jesus say about a troubled heart? And so I would like you, if you have your Bibles with you, to go ahead and open to John 14, right? That's where we're going to be looking at. That's where today's I am statement is. Uh, But before we get to that, we need to set up the context of why he's saying this. It doesn't just pop out of nowhere, right? It has a reason. In the context, the backstory to what's going on is the Last Supper, And the Last Supper is one of the most famous parts of the Bible. It's something that even a lot of non-Christians are familiar with, right? We got this beautiful picture that that shows it, all right? And, And for that, this is a huge deal for Christians, right? We get to see so much of who Jesus is. We get to see the humble servant who washes his disciples' feet. He institutes communion, the practice of communion, something we're going to do today as a church. And he sends the Holy Spirit for us to live within us. He makes that promise to us. It's so much of what we know and love about Jesus is in this story. But we, of course, we have the benefit of the entirety of this story. We can look back and say, what a beautiful thing. But I want to take a moment to put you in the shoes of the disciples. Because for us, this is beautiful. But in that moment, I think this is a really difficult time because Jesus comes in and he shatters all their expectations. He flips the table over on what they're expecting, right? So it starts out not just at the Last Supper, but beforehand, right? The triumphal entry. Jesus comes in and the city celebrating their king has arrived and he invites his friends, his disciples to dinner, not just any dinner, the Passover dinner, the most important tradition that they have. And they're sitting down and the whole night is going swimmingly. It's beautiful, And then Jesus gets up and he takes a wash basin and a cloth and he washes each and every one of the disciples' feet. Their stinky, filthy, disgusting feet. And he humbles them. And then he takes the meal, right? He takes the bread and the wine and he blesses it and he feeds himself to his disciples. The night has just got really weird. And he's going to take it a step further. Jesus is going to tell them, Everything that's going to come, he says, all right, all this is going on now. Here's the deal. One of you is going to betray me. And the disciples react in confusion. Who, him? Me? It's certainly not me. It must be him. And what, Jesus, what do you mean by betrayed? Like, they don't understand that he's meaning betrayal to the point of death. They're, they, they are completely lost. And then on top of that, he says, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm out of here. I'm leaving you guys Thanks for your time with me. I'm going away. And then he turns to Peter in response to Peter, excuse me, because Peter says, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to follow you. I will even lay down my life for you. And Peter's speaking for himself, but I think there's an aspect that he's kind of saying what all the disciples are thinking. You're not leaving us. I'm going with you. I'm, I'm the loyal disciple, right? And Jesus says, Peter, you are not. You're not as loyal as you think. You're not as tough as you think. You won't lay down your life for me at this point. You're going to deny me when people ask if you knew me. For us, this is the last supper. But for the disciples, this is the worst supper, right? They're never going to want to go to eat with Jesus again because Jesus is just, he's too intense, right? And Jesus, he's going to follow up all of this with a powerful, powerful statement. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Yeah, easy for you to say, Jesus. Like, did you just listen to everything you just said? Of course the disciples are troubled. But Jesus isn't going to leave it there. He's not like, all right, don't be troubled and I'm out of here, figure it out on your own. No, he's going to give us this whole thing about why we no longer have to be troubled, right? He's going to provide the antidote to the trouble that the disciples are experiencing, to the trouble that we are experiencing, right? And I want to I wanna make sure, uh, before we move on, that we're clear about what Jesus is talking about when he says troubled. Because we, go, we look at troubled, and it means so much to us, right? Troubled. Tr- sometimes being troubled is a good thing, right? This, this like an, a holy discontent. We see injustice in the world, and it wells up in us compassion and empathy and sometimes righteous anger. And it doesn't lead us to sin or lack faith. It leads us to bless people, to be agents of God on earth. 
Right? That's, that's one of the difficulties when we go from the original text language to English. This troubled for us covers so much, and sometimes we should be troubled. As long as we remain faithful in God, that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about a very specific kind of trouble. In the original language, this trouble is to strike one's spirit with fear or dread. That's that flip side of troubled. And it leads us, right, to respond in fear, dread, anxiety. It reveals a lack of faith and trust in God's will and plan. And it leads us to the point where we become often paralyzed or we act out of panic. This is the troubled heart that Jesus is talking about. And it's the troubled heart that he's going to explain why we don't have to have, right? He's going to go on. He says, you believe in God, also believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Jesus, right, he answers directly one of the troubles that they're experiencing. Jesus is leaving, right, and they're experiencing both sides of that trouble. One, that grief, their friend is leaving, but also, I, I try to, put, like, as I look at them, I wonder what they're thinking, right? Is that trouble selfish in the sense, oh, Jesus, you're leaving, what's the deal, man? I just gave three years of my life to you. I left my career, I left my family behind, and now you're just gonna bounce out of here? I'm gonna look like a fool to everyone. I have nothing, I gave it all to you. Or, or the selfishness, excuse me, are the selfishness of, this isn't what you promised. You were going to be a literal king, and now you're leaving us with nothing. Right? And Jesus is going to address that. He says, I'm not leaving you simply for the sake of leaving you. I'm leading, leaving you according to the plan of the Father. I am going to prepare something greater. He says, you don't have to be troubled because Jesus is preparing you a place. Jesus is preparing the disciples a place, and he's preparing us a place for all believers. And this place is heaven. He's going away to accomplish his work on the cross so that we can have eternity in heaven with him and the Father, with God. He's leaving for a reason. He's answering the greatest need that we have in our life the greatest trouble that we have in our life, that with, apart from God, in the end, we are going to be eternally separated from him. And he says, I'm going to take care of all of that. And, and I love, and, and also I'm bothered by it, but I love Thomas's reaction because I think it's often how we react, right? And it's a little bit of what was talked about last week with Martha. Like, okay, Jesus, I heard you. I know, but, right? Because Thomas says to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And they're not listening. They're so focused on the trouble they're experiencing, the trouble of their heart, that they miss that Jesus just explained this. He explained where he's going. He explained the way to get there, and they missed it. And so Jesus is going to respond now with his I am statement. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus answers in this like really meta way before meta was a thing like in the 2010s for that brief period of time, right? He's going to say all of the answer resides in me, right? I am going away to prepare a place for you. Then I'm coming back for you. And then I'm taking you. And the way you get there is me. And when you get there, you get me forever to be with me, right? Jesus is it all. And this statement, right, carries so much power. It's a simple statement, and it means so much. First off, right, it's a, the, the, it's, it uses the definitive article. It's not Jesus is a way. Jesus is an a truth. Jesus is an a life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. In the original language, it would be better to say, I myself and only I am the way, and I myself and only I am the truth, and I myself and only I am the life. 
Jesus says the answer to all of your problems reside in me, and they don't exist anywhere else, right? The only way to heaven, the only way to be with him exists in Jesus. He is the only way to the Father. It can't be found in any religion. It can't be found in any other person. It can't be found in anything that you can do that you can be good enough. He is the way. And we don't have to be troubled because he is providing that for us. He provides the place where we are ultimately going to rest. Jesus says, in essence, I am not just good, even though he is that, right? He is necessary. For you to have eternity, you need Jesus. And as I was studying this, right, uh, preparing to speak for you guys today, I went to John Piper because I love John Piper. I love reading how he explains things. And I came across a quote that really uh, expounds on this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I shared it with the teaching team, and they had this to say that it was fire, So I'm going to share it now with you. I'm going to share the quote uh, from John Piper that is fire, right? And it's speaking from the perspective of Jesus. I go to prepare a place for you. And as I go, I become the way that you get there. I am the truth that you hold on to to get there. And I am the life, the eternal life that you will enjoy when you get there. When I say I go to prepare a place for you, I mean I open the way and I am the way. I confirm the truth and I am the truth. I purchased the life, and I am that life. I'm just going to leave that statement right there. I'm not going to go any farther. I don't think I can do any better than John Piper. Jesus, though, he's not going to leave just with he's going to prepare a place. He's going to expound on this a lot more. He has more for us about why we no longer have to be troubled. And the second one is you don't have to be troubled because you know the Father, right? And he continues this I am statement. It's, he keeps going on. He says, If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus is speaking to the idea idea, that he and the father are perfectly united, right? He's kind of hinting toward this triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're, They're all God. And when you see Jesus, you see him, right? And this isn't the first time he's ever pointed to this. If you read through John, he points to this time and time and time again. And what we see time and time again is just like Philip. He says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Like he just, again, completely misses what Jesus has to say. And he goes searching. He says, everything you're saying sounds really good, Jesus, but I really need the Father to co-sign this. Then I'll believe. And, and like he just missed it. Jesus said the Father and I are together. Like what, what's the deal? And I, and I always struggled. Excuse me. I always struggled with this question, like, what is the importance here? Why is he asking about the Father? Jesus is God on earth. Why is that not good enough? Why does he need the Father on top of this? And I think this is a cultural issue, right? And, 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 it, and I can relate it to us. We as a church, as Christians, as Christ followers, we have elevated the importance of Christ. And I don't want to slam that. That is, that is absolutely right to do so. Jesus, the Son, right? He came and died for us. He is our salvation, but what I think it's the side effect that it has done is it has pushed down, lowered the importance of the Father and the Holy Spirit. We spend all our time on Jesus and we miss out on the Father and the Holy Spirit. And I see this play out time and time again. Actually, it would repeat itself when, as I was a children's pastor, right? I would ask kids, who is Jesus? Oh, he's God, which is absolutely correct. But when I would ask them God, who God is, it was always Jesus, and there's truth in there, right? Jesus is one third of the persons of the Trinity, but the Father and Son, our Father and Holy Spirit never came up, right? That's what we have focused so much on and we're missing out. <clears throat> and when Philip is talking, he's kind of inverted that elevation. Instead of Christ being elevated, they have elevated the Father, and rightfully so in a lot of ways, right? Because the Father is everything to them. He's it, okay? <clears throat> Because as Jewish peoples, that's what they know, right? Jesus, the Messiah, and he's what's to come. He's their promise, but they don't really spend much time knowing about him because Jesus just showed up on the scene. Everything through their history has been the Father. The Father was the God of Abraham, right? He's the one who promised that they would be a nation that would bless all the earth. He, the Father was the one who led Moses and the people out of slavery across the desert and fed them and gave them water. 
And on and on again, the Father, the Father, the Father, with the sprinkling of Jesus to come, the Son to come, and the Holy Spirit somewhere in there. Right? So when he's looking for the Father, he's still struggling, wrestling with that idea, Jesus is God, Father is God, and they're perfectly united. They were looking for the Father, trying to understand the Son better. And Jesus says, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Verily, truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Jesus makes it very clear that when, you, when the disciples saw Jesus, they were seeing the Father. They are distinct persons, but they are both God. And everything that Jesus was doing on earth was under the authority and submission of the Father. He was doing it to glorify the Father, to point to the Father, right? The Father is the one who came up with the plan of redemption. Jesus was now living it out on earth. But everything was connected. When you saw the work of Jesus, you saw the work of the Father. And this was really important to them that they understood that the authority he was speaking with came from the Father. It was of God. But I think it has valuable value for us too that I don't want us to miss. All right? Because what we often see is that we believe Jesus and God, or excuse me, Jesus and the Father are both God, but we've created these distinct entities, right? The Father is often this, this Old Testament wrathful, vicious, angry God who's ready to smite you if you mess up. And, and then there's Jesus. He's completely the opposite. He's compassionate and loving and caring and sacrificial. And he's here to lay down his life for you. And we too often created this divide between the two. And Jesus is saying there is no divide. The compassion and the love, the empathy, the sacrifice that you see in Jesus all starts with the Father. He is living out the will and the plan of the Father. And everything we see on Jesus, out of Jesus on earth, starts with the Father. They are not two distinct entities in emotion and how they act. They are perfectly united. So when we see the work of Jesus in our lives, we are seeing the work of the Father in our lives. There's another part in there that often brings up confusion. It's asking me, right? This, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And it's created this like uh, vending machine Jesus. If I, just, if I want something, I just ask Jesus for it and then he's obligated to deliver it to me, right? If I need a second truck and I just ask Jesus and I'm a follower, he's gonna bless me with another truck, right? It's not how it works at all. What Jesus is speaking to is that when you ask the Father in his name, you are doing it under the account of him right? You are doing it through Jesus, and he is willing to give you what you ask for when it matches up with his character and his will. Not when it's out of selfishness or ego or pride, but when you are praying to God, asking for him for something, and it matches his will and his character, right? He's obligated to build that up and give that to you. But outside of that, when we go to ask, right, he's not giving it to us. It's only under those conditions. And these two ways that I've talked about, about how we don't have to be troubled, right? These are incredibly important. I can sum it up in just this one idea that we, because we know Jesus, we know God, and we are going to be reunited with him for eternity. And this solves, again, our greatest need, right? Our greatest trouble is that we have been uh, we have been torn apart from God. We, are, we cannot be with him for eternity because of our sin. And Jesus says, you don't have to be troubled with that. That existential question that we all wrestle with, what happens after I die? Jesus answers that. And that's so amazing, but this is where I have struggled my entire life. But what about today, God? Like, that's great. You saved me, and, and when I die, I get to go to heaven. But I got this, this time in between 
that you've abandoned me. It's really great that I don't have to be troubled when I'm at heaven, but for these years, like, this world is a mess. Sin has ravaged it, and I am experiencing trouble, and sin has ravaged me, and my heart is often troubled. What about today? And I think Jesus understood that, and he says, in essence, you don't have to be troubled because the Holy Spirit lives within you. That yes, he was leaving physically from earth, but he wasn't leaving us behind with nothing. He goes on to say, if you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Yes, Jesus is leaving physically, but he says he's not leaving us as orphans. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live in each and every believer. And when it does so, right, it wants to transform us. It wants to grow something within us. One of those things, the fruit of the Spirit, is what he wants to grow, oh, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. He wants to grow peace inside of you. And peace, peace is the opposite, right? The opposite of troubled heart. Peace is the opposite of fear. That through the Holy Spirit living within us, not of anything that we're going to do, but the Holy Spirit living within us, we can have peace in the face of trouble. We can experience troubles, but we don't have to be troubled. When I was, when I was a kid, right, I... I I played, uh, I grew up playing hockey. Like, it was my first passion. It was the first thing I ever fell in love with. It was the only time I ever truly felt free. I could just go out and play, and for an hour, the whole world disappeared. It was just what I was doing. And I, any type of hockey, ice hockey, roller hockey, whatever it was, I was on board to play. And I remember a specific year I was playing as a kid, right? Uh, I would often play with my cousin, right? He grew up in a broken household. He was raised by a single mom. He had two siblings, and so they were always busy. And so my parents decided that they were going to bring my cousin along with us. And, and this, this had a problem, right? He was a year older than me. And if you know anything about youth sports, they divide it, right? They break up the leagues by age because of development, how the body develops, right? Well, him being a year older than me meant that every other year, we couldn't be on the same team. And the league saw this issue, and they wanted to do something. They said, okay, you guys can be on the same team. But my cousin, he would have to come down. Or he, excuse me, he couldn't come down to play with me. I would have to move up an age group to play with him, right? It wouldn't be fair if he moved down, so I would go up. And I spent this entire season troubled. See, what would happen is after every game, I would be done, and what would race through my mind is I am not enough. The team needs more from me. I'm holding them back. And the truth is, I wasn't enough. I was the worst player on our team, maybe the worst player in the league. Right? And, it, and it played out in a tangible way. I didn't score a single goal the entire season. Right? I, in a way, I was holding my team back. And I want to give credit to them. They never once made me feel that way. Not the players, not the coaches, not the parents. This was something that was going on inside of me. Right? I had created this story that when I, had, when I wasn't beside them, they were going, man, I really wish we could replace Drew. Then we would be a great team. But with him, we're just kind of okay. And this trouble, this not enough issue that I had, <clears throat> what I found is it would, it would persist no matter what. See, years later, as the years went on in hockey, I was no longer the worst player on my team. There were a lot of years where I was the best player on my team or among the best player in the league, right? And you know what I would go home thinking after every game? I'm not enough. The team needs more from me. I'm holding them back. See, this idea that I can't be enough, right? The truth is I can't, right? Because when I can't be enough, that bar, it just always keeps raising. I'm never going to be enough because what's enough never is the same thing. It's always just out of reach. And that's how it is 
for us, or excuse me, that's how it's been for me my entire life. This idea that I'm not going to be enough. And really, that's all I want in life is to be known that I'm enough, that I'm a good enough dad, that I'm a good enough husband, that I'm a good enough pastor, that I'm a good enough on and on and on. And the truth is, I'm not good enough. And in my own power, I will never be. Because at my core, my sinful nature, I am selfish. I'm quick to anger. I'm, I'm grouchy. I'm irritable, right? I have a wit that is used mostly, was, or for a while, just to put people down, to build myself up. I was not enough. And I am not enough. But the great thing is this Holy Spirit that lives up in me, he can take my not enoughness and he can do, he can do amazing things with that because he is more than enough. God, the God that lives inside me is powerful. And he can transform me. He can take all those negative qualities about me. He can transform them and get rid of them and redeem them so that I can look more like Jesus, that I can live out the mission of Jesus in my daily life. And it doesn't matter if I'm not enough because he is. And I didn't share the end of that, that hockey story, right? And I want to be really careful because I don't want to spiritualize a hockey story, but I think it kind, of, it kind of points to the work of the Spirit, right? See, that year with my cousin, I wasn't enough. Right? We get to the championship game. Like, I was really weird out. I was holding them back. We were, we were a good team. I wasn't good. And we get to the championship game. It's the third period. The score's tied one-to-one. -one. And if you don't know anything about hockey, like, it's the end of the game, and it's tied. Somebody has to win this game, and, it, and it's right there at the end. And I get my little like hallmark moment in life, like the one that you watch the movie and like, that doesn't happen in real life. It did. I score the winning goal. We go up two to one, the period, you know, I, that ends up winning it for us. And everyone goes nuts, right? My team goes nuts. They're like tackling me on the ice. I can't get off the ice because as the players are coming on, they're just like mobbing me. One of the, our best players on the team, like he wants to hug me and instead clotheslines me in his excitement. And the parents are in the stands uh, for our team. They're going nuts like, little Drew did it. Yes. Like, it's so out of control. My mom tells me that after the game, like, the parents were like getting, the other team's parents were getting upset. They're like, it's just a kid's game. Can you keep your composure, please? And they're like, no, you don't get it. Drew's been beating himself up for months and he finally did it. And funny enough, right, I still, people still remember this to this day. Uh, I, I got the game puck afterwards, right, and people uh, anybody you're associated with the team, one of the first things they ask me, do you still have the puck? Do you still sleep with the puck, right? Because for a month, I would literally sleep with the puck by my side, right? right? But I think that's often how it kind of looks in life, that I wasn't enough, and yet I was able to win. And in real life, right, I'm not enough. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, he can get the job done that he could take me places that I couldn't imagine when I stopped focusing on my lack of ability or who I am and start focusing on God. And when I start focusing on the Holy Spirit, when I start abiding in him daily, those stories I shared at the beginning, right, those were all me in case you didn't catch on. And as we were going up that hill outside of Camas Valley and my heart dropped, about 10, 15 years ago, I would have been a wreck, right? I would be just raging inside, snappy, cussing, being just a jerk to my family. And what I was able to do was continue to keep my focus on God. And so I just started praying, Lord, yes, please make my truck work. But more than that, just give me peace during this time. I trust you. I trust what you have planned for us. And if I have to call a tow truck, so be it. But let me be an example to my wife. Let me be an example to my kids of how you would have handled the situation so that they can look not just at me, but they can look to you and you can be glorified. It wasn't out of anything that I willed in myself. It was entirely the Spirit working through me. That Jesus says that you can have all these external circumstances, but when you focus on him, your internal condition and stay at peace. Jesus says, you don't have to be troubled because I am the way, the truth, and the life. That he is the way, he is the one and only way to a relationship for eternity with him. He is the truth. He is the creator of the universe. And in knowing him, you know God. And he is the life. Yes, the life that we get for eternity with him, but he's also the abundant life that we can have today when we live in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to release to the camp uh, pastors. Uh, and they're going to walk through our transformational and our missional moment looking at what uh, you've taken about how you don't have to experience trouble in your life. Thank you, guys. Thanks for sticking around for our transformational and missional moments. And today we want to ask you a question. What do you believe After hearing today's sermon, what do you believe? What do you believe about how Jesus, how God is going to change you in these times when our hearts are troubled? Because what often happens is in those times of trouble, right, our heart being troubled reveals our unbelief about who God is and how he's working within us. So what do you believe? Not just what do you know up in your head about who God, who Jesus is and what he's doing, but what do you need to believe fully that permeates your very being, your heart, that you can live out? And the second question is, what will you do? Out of that belief, what will you do so that you don't have to be troubled? Uh, there's a lot of things that I think you guys can personally wrestle with, but I want to share what I took from this as I was preparing this, that I am to abide in God, that in my own power I cannot overcome the trouble in my heart, but through the Holy Spirit of trusting in God, of spending time continually with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, with the Father, that I can overcome those troubles through them. In our missional moment, right? That Holy Spirit that is living inside you that wants to build something up, that wants to give you peace, he wants to build that up so it's overflowing so that we can live on mission with him, right? And we've been going through this blessed strategy. The first one, B, begin with prayer. This is abiding with him in the sense that we are starting our day praying to God, I want to be on mission with you. Open my eyes to where you are working so I can join in. Make me aware of what's happening and then the listen, right? That when we find those people, when we rec- recognize what's going on, where God is working, that we take the time to slow down and yes, ask probing questions, but more than that, listen. Listen to where they are hurting, what is going on in their life because when we listen, right, when we first listen to what people have to say, it is then that they are willing to hear why we are changed and why we are living out the fruit of the Spirit in our life. Thank you guys. I love you and have a good day.